And we are live. So good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are so excited today. We've got a new speaker joining us. I'm going to introduce him in just a minute. But right now, we've got five classes coming in from across North America. I'm going to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. We've got Miss Penfolds, K through eights in Orangeville in Ontario. Hi, guys. Come in. Hey, there we are. <laughs> Mike's a little heavy <laughs> there. Hey, okay. <laughs> We've got Miss Gertzen's grade fours in Bueller in Kansas. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, welcome in. We've got Miss Yusko's grade fours in Algonquin in Illinois. Hi, guys. Hey, hey, we've got Miss Hodder's grade fours and a whole bunch of other classes in Calgary in Alberta. Hi, guys. So many of you. There's so many. It's breaking the mic again. Oh, dear. That's awesome. <laughs> and last but not least, right now, we've got Miss Dodie's grade sixes in Flemington in New Jersey. Hi, guys. Uh, yeah. Hey, welcome in. Hey, <laughs> of course, the reason you guys are all joining us today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada by Dr. Jordan Mallon. So he has the job that all of us at one point or other in our lives wish we had or wish we have had. Um, and he is a dinosaur paleontologist. So he is at the Canadian Museum of Nature, one of the most iconic and elite facilities for research and showcasing science to the public in all of Canada. And today he's going to explore a little bit about his own journey to become a paleontologist, what he gets to do in the field, and just explore a little bit about why dinosaurs are so awesome. So without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Dr. Mallon, and take it away. Well, thanks for having me, Jesse. And, and to all of you uh, watching from the schools all across North America, I, I think that's pretty cool. It, it's amazing what technology can do today to, to bring us together. So. Uh, I've, I've got a little presentation to share with you guys, and I guess, Jesse, I meant to share the screen. Is that correct here? Uh, let's see here. It wants to work. All right, hold up. How's that, <laughs> how's that looking? No, so it's not up yet. So the little green box at the bottom of your screen, bring that up, and then we should be good. All right, hold, hold on here. Let me share a different one then. See, we complimented the technology and then it had to thwart us. <laughs> um, so that comes up fine. Right now I've got your slide deck on the left, your main slide in the middle. All right, hold on here. We had it working earlier, didn't we? We did, we tested it like an hour ago. It's totally fine. All right, all right. So, so what are you seeing here? Are you seeing my, my so slide? Right now, I still see your slide. Yeah, yeah, I see your slide filling the whole screen. What's All right, like to be a paleontologist. Yeah, I, uh, I'm a paleontologist. I'm not a, a rocket scientist, so sometimes it takes me a bit to get technology to work. Here. <laughs> so probably the most, you know, the question I'm asked the most, certainly by a lot of kids interested in becoming paleontologists, is what is it like to be a paleontologist? Uh, what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, we're used to seeing paleontologists in movies like you know Jurassic Park and they're running around dinosaur islands. Um, we don't do that today, maybe not surprisingly. Um, and 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 so so people are curious to know what exactly does a paleontologist do. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about that today. What do I do on a daily basis, and and how did I get to be where I am today? Um, so as, as Jesse already mentioned, I work at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, and uh, we are Canada's national uh, natural history museum. We have a focus on plants, we have a focus on animals, we have a focus on, on water, we have a new exhibit coming on, on um, the ice ages over time, um, all over the world. Um, but we also have a, a, a gallery of, of um, fossils, dinosaurs and mammals and fishes, you name it. And uh, this is where I work today. I, I grew up going to this museum. Um, I'm born and raised in Ottawa. And here's a picture of me uh, as a kid at the just outside the museum. Uh, that's me on the left there in the, the blue and the red coat. So probably the same age as many of you kids. Um, uh, 
you know, I, I was I was coming to this museum and looking at the exhibits and uh, so that was definitely uh, just visiting the museum was definitely a, a sort of a highlight or a stepping stone on my way to becoming a paleontologist. That's what really uh, kept me motivated over the years was returning to the museum and and filling my eye, my eyes with with fossils and, and becoming fascinated along the way. Another big one for me was uh, seeing Jurassic Park. I was 11 years old when uh, Jurassic Park came out. Uh, very impressionable age, I guess. Um, and I went to see that movie. Um, it was, I guess it was at the end of uh, grade five. My dad took me to, to see that movie. That was my present for graduating. Uh, so I remember seeing that movie and, and that left a big impression too on a young and impressionable mind. I, I knew that day I really wanted to uh, be serious about becoming a paleontologist. Also, growing up in the Ottawa area, we don't have fossils around here, or at least I should say we don't have dinosaur fossils around here, but we do have a lot of marine fossils that predate the age of the dinosaurs by really by hundreds of millions of years, including stuff like uh, these little Cheerio rings, I call them, what are called crinoids. Um, some of the first fossils I found in the Ottawa area were these crinoids, and they always fascinated me. And, and again, they, they all of these things together, going to the museum, seeing Jurassic Park, collecting my first fossils, sort of pushed me on the way to becoming a paleontologist. These little things add up over time. Um, and so by the time it, by the time I graduated high school, and, and I know that seems a, a long way off for a lot of you out there, but it's not, uh, I decided uh, to pursue paleontology as my career. Uh, in university. So I mentioned uh, I'm originally from Ottawa, but, uh, and so I went to Carleton University here in Ottawa. They have a, a paleontology program. And after I got what's called a bachelor's degree, spent four years doing that, I went on to the University of Calgary where I lived for almost six years. I know we've got uh, a class here from Calgary today. Um, so I lived in Calgary myself for almost six years at the University of Calgary, where I got my, my PhD. And uh, there's a little slide there. I don't know if you can see me in the, in the green sweater there with my, my cohort, both from the University of, of Calgary and from uh, uh, the University of Alberta in Edmonton. And so these were very formative years to me. This is where I, I learned how to do uh, what I do today, really. Um, when I was at the University of Calgary, my, my PhD work, my doctorate work, was looking at the ecology of, of big herbivorous dinosaurs, like these duck-billed hadrosaurs, uh, these club-tailed ankylosaurs that you're seeing coming up on your screen now, and, and the, the horned dinosaurs like Styracosaurus that you're seeing off to the left of your screen there right now. Um, I'm sure a lot of you kids are very familiar with these animals, so I don't have to explain a lot about them. Um, but one thing that really did interest me was how did these animals live alongside one another? Were they competing with one another? Were they not competing with one another? Were they sharing their food? And, and what kind of food were they eating? So I was looking at their skulls and I was looking at their teeth to try and learn something about how these animals lived in their environment. So that was a really... Uh, uh, interesting and, and fun time in my life was was working on my PhD degree. Uh, after I got my my PhD uh, in Calgary, I moved uh, back to Ottawa. There was a, a job position uh, open at the museum here for a dinosaur paleontologist. So for me, the timing couldn't have worked out better. And uh, I work now in the research and collections building of the Canadian Museum of Nature. So the slide I showed before that looked like a big castle, that's the museum proper where we have our displays. But I actually work uh, several miles away uh, at the research and collections building. It's actually on the, on the Quebec side of uh, the Ottawa River. And this is where I'm speaking to you from uh, now is, is from this building where we hold all of our fossils that are not on display and where we do our research on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as far as what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, probably a lot of you would guess that I, I do field work. That is to say, I, I go out to the Badlands and I collect fossils. And that's very much true. Uh, usually I'm out uh, in the field doing uh, my field work about, uh, for about a month of the year, I would say. 
Um, and so I've done field work, you know, several places. Uh, I, I, I've been uh, to Texas to do field work. Uh, I've done field work in Saskatchewan. In fact, I'll be doing some today. Most of my field work, I'd say, uh, I do in Alberta. So I'm, I return uh, to Alberta every year on what's called the, the South Saskatchewan River. Uh, and we collect, you know, fossils of, of dinosaurian age. So that includes not just dinosaurs, but that includes uh, turtles, that includes crocodiles, um, all kinds of different animals that lived during the age of the dinosaurs that were not dinosaurs themselves. So uh, I'm looking at my screen here. You can see uh, towards the middle, there's a fossilized footprint, that sort of rusty colored uh, image or, 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 or impression with the, the pick next to it. It's a, it's a very worn footprint. We collect teeth, we collect uh, complete skeletons. And I thought I'd show you a little bit about what we've collected over the years. Uh, one thing uh, that I discovered several years ago was this bone bed, or it's what we call, a, it's like a mass graveyard of uh, these horn dinosaurs you can see here called Centrosaurus with a big horn on the nose and these sort of funky uh, spikes coming off the back of the frill. It's a relative of Triceratops. And uh, the bone bed that we're working in has hundreds of these animals that all died together at the same time and all of their bones got jumbled up together. Um, so I've been working on that bone bed with my students now for the last several years and we're going to be returning this summer uh, to work on that again. Uh, what else have we found? Oh, this is a cool one. Hopefully I can get this animation to show. Uh, this was the skull of a horned dinosaur that I found uh, back in 2015, I think it was. Um, and there's my assistant Margaret there for scale. Uh, she works here with me at the museum. And what you're looking at is the skull of a horned dinosaur on the ground and it's kind of hard to see that shape. So what I've done here is I've got a little animation that's going to overlie. This is the skull of a Chasmosaurus and you can see that it's going to rotate into place here. So hopefully you can see that, that shape um, of the skull. And uh, this was a, a big find. It's pretty rare that we get to find, you know, nice skulls when we're doing field work. Uh, and so when I found this, uh, and my crew and I spent a, a couple of years really digging it up, uh, we were pretty excited about it. Uh, in fact, I put together a little video that I'm going to show you guys that depicts uh, the, the time we spent collecting this. Whoop, it's playing right here right now. Um, so this was just uh, a little video that we made uh, over a period of a couple of years showing where we are on the South Saskatchewan River. You can, you can see the sort of landscape here. It's just a, a gorgeous place to work. And uh, this is us. Uh, after we're finding the skull, we made what's called a field jacket. So there's uh, my, my assistant and I making this field jacket. It's uh, it's a it's a protective layer of, of burlap and plaster. When we found the skull, we we expose it and we wrap it in this field jacket in order to protect it while we're bringing it to the museum. And there's my assistant Shang there, sort of digging a trench because what we need to do now is we need to roll that jacket over uh, so that we can finish plastering the other side and get it ready uh, to be lifted by helicopter in this case. Um, we worked in a very, very remote area and it was just not possible to remove that skull with a car or put it on a truck or something like that. So we actually had to remove it by helicopter. And there we are rolling it into uh, the, the helicopter cargo net, which is pretty cool. We're seeing the helicopter come in now to, to pick up our load. And there's me getting ready to, to hook it up. That was scary. <laughs> and here it is lifting off that load. And it's, we're going to move that skull now onto the prairie level where we're going to put it on the back of a truck. And there's me shouting cool. I, <laughs> I, I thought I'd never experienced a, a helicopter lift before. So I got to ride in the helicopter too, which was pretty cool. So this is us setting down the package. 
And now what we're going to do is we're going to move that skull that we just got out of the Badlands uh, onto a, a flatbed truck and eventually transport it back to the museum in Ottawa. So this is our, our skull arriving here at the Museum of Nature. That's my assistant Alan there rolling it down to our prep lab. And this is this is me opening up the, the package. So this is basically how we get a dinosaur fossil uh, from the field uh, into our, our into our museum collections here. And uh, we've been working now on the skull for the last, oh, couple of years or so. There we go. And uh, one of the things that came out of it was uh, we got some nice uh, um, uh, media attention too. So that's another aspect of paleontology. A lot of people are interested in it and a lot of people want to know what we're up to when we're out in the field. And so we did have uh, camera crews come out uh, uh, from the media, from the news, uh, to document what we were doing. So we got some nice coverage that way, which is pretty cool. And as I say, we've been working on preparing the skull the last uh, couple of years. Um, and this is what it's looking like uh, relatively recently. It's actually closer to being uh, completely um, uh, finished now, but off to the left there, you can see the snout of the animal. In the middle, you can see that sort of that round uh, hole, that gray looking hole there, that's the eye socket. We've got the horns coming off over top. Of course, the left horn over the eye is missing, uh, but we, we, we have it, we just haven't glued it on yet. We're gonna be doing that shortly. And then off to the back is the, the frill of the dinosaur. All these horned dinosaurs had these big frills that came off the back of the head. So this is an animal called uh, Chasmosaurus. And uh, I'll be researching this now over the next couple of years, or maybe with a student, uh, I'll have work, uh, work up that particular project. So pretty cool, uh, rescuing a, a horned dinosaur skull from the Badlands. That was a big undertaking and it was a, a cool part of my job. Uh, another thing I'm involved with quite a, a bit is uh, outreach. So uh, beyond you know digging these animals up and studying them, um, I, I have to interview with, or, or interact, I should say, with the public a lot, just like I'm speaking with you guys today, uh, to inform, you know, uh, the, the public about what it is that I do or, and, and, and what's the latest on the research we've done. So you can see some stamps that are up there. This was a, a series of stamps put out by uh, Canada Post uh, several years ago now, but I was the scientific advisor on those stamps, so I helped the artist design them. Uh, it was a pretty easy job there. Uh, that artwork is done by a friend of mine named uh, Julius Chittany, and uh, Julius is just one of the best paleo artists out there today. So he knows what I'm doing. I just shook my head the whole time and goes, yep, that looks pretty good. <laughs> um, what else? Um, I, I've, I've uh, been an advisor on various books too. This is a, a book here, What If You Had T-Rex Teeth that just came out, I guess uh, about a year ago. And I helped uh, review some of the science there. I get to go on TV sometimes to talk about my research um, or, or the, the latest state of paleontology. I've, I've done various podcasts. Uh, I Know Dino and the Dinosaur George podcast are, are really good uh, listens for, for kids about your age. So I'd encourage you guys to check that out too. And I've done various you know, shows on YouTube as well. So again, this is all public outreach and it's becoming a, it's a big part of being a scientist today uh, is letting the public know what it is that you're up to. Um, of course, it's not just me who's producing science in my lab, but I now have a lot of students of my own who are working with me. And, and so um, since I began uh, supervising student research, oh, maybe going back, uh, I'd say about three years now, um, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, it, it's been a lot of fun uh, uh, getting kids coming through, or well, I call them kids, they're adults, but they're kids to me, <laughs> uh, coming through and researching in my collections with me, helping me out with my projects, and I help them out with their projects, and, and we sort of learn uh, from one another, and they get to come into the field with me too, and, uh, and help me out. So uh, I hope that I can be a, a good teacher uh, to them. And in the process, uh, I learn a lot from them as well. And maybe some of you kids out there today uh, will be uh, 
in my lab, that would be really cool. Um, here's hoping. Um, as far as the research that I've done, uh, I get to work on a lot of really cool dinosaur projects here at the museum, uh, including this one. This is a, a scientific paper that I wrote um, several years ago now. This is back in 2016. I got to name a new species of horned dinosaur that we have in the museum. Uh, this is an animal called uh, Spiclipius. Um, and Spiclipius means spiked shield in reference to that, that cool frill on the back of the head. This is a a relative of, of Triceratops. It lived several mil millions of years before Triceratops. Uh, and you can see it has that very distinctive display on the back of its head. I, I have a little animation to play of the skull rotating around. This was an animal that was found um, uh, in Montana uh, by a man by the name of Bill Ship. And uh, we were lucky enough, uh, Bill Ship, uh, worked it out so that we could get this skull in our museum. And so I, I named the species name after Bill and his family. So it's Spiclipius shiporum. And you can see this skull now on display in our fossil gallery at the museum. Beautiful, beautiful skull. Very lucky to be involved with that. One of the coolest new dinosaurs to my mind. Um, I also did some research on a, on a group of animals called ankylosaurs. These are the ones with the big clubs on the ends of their tails. Um, and for whatever reason, uh, they're found upside down. When we, when we find them in the field, when we find them in the, in the rocks, in the badlands, um, more often than not, they're, they're turned over so that they're laying on their backs. And that's been a very, you know, puzzling thing. Why should that be? Why should these, these big ankylosaurs be found on their backs uh, so often. And so I did a study with some colleagues uh, of mine and we found out that the reason why they're on their backs is because when they're preserved, they often wash into to streams. Uh, and when they wash into those streams, their backs of course are weighed down by it, this hemi, heavy coating of armor and their stomachs gas up as they as they die they bloat up they get really disgusting and those stomachs want to float up and those heavy backs want to uh, sink to the bottom uh and and so they they turn over uh in the process of of becoming preserved and so uh that was a really fun uh series series of experiments that we did we did some computer modeling modeling that you can see at the bottom there and recently there was a, a documentary on a, on a, well, the documentary is called The Nature of Things. And uh, one of my uh, co-workers here, this is Don Henderson, um, uh, got to talk about our research together, especially with reference to this uh, one ankylosaur that he's looking at here called Borealapelta. Um, actually, some of you kids in, in Calgary there might have seen this animal. This is now um, a, a new species of ankylosaur on display at the Tyrrell Museum. Uh, so you can see it there today, and my co-author there, my co-worker Don Henderson, helped me write up this paper on upside down ankylosaurs. So there's a, a cool little story there. And lastly, this is the last thing I'll talk about. Um, I mentioned I've got uh, students of my own, and now they're publishing their research, um, which is really cool. Um, so it's kind of come full circle, where I started out as a student, as I talked about, um, learning new things about dinosaurs, doing new research on dinosaurs, and now my students are turning over their own research. Um, and so we've come full circle. This is my student, uh, Tom Dudgeon here, and he recently published his first paper on this, this uh, interesting group of uh, aquatic reptiles called Champsosaurus. They look a lot like, uh, like crocodiles. Uh, these guys lived alongside dinosaurs as well. And so we're learning a lot about Champsosaurus anatomy and their lifestyles. Uh, through the research, the original research of my student Tom here. So as I say, you know, having students of my own is, is really cool. And uh, hopefully one day I might have some of you as my students. So with that, we'll come full circle and uh, I'll wrap it up and I'll be happy to take your questions, guys. Well, thank you so, so much for that, Dr. Mellon. That was amazing. Um, yeah, let's dive in with questions, guys. We've got a bunch of quest classes watching on YouTube as well. So if you guys want to type your questions in the chat bar, please do, and I'll pass them along. But let's start um, by going to Ms. Penfold's class. If you guys want to kick us off and come on up, go for it. Uh, and then go. Um, go fast. Where 
Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> um, if no, actually, I forget. What? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's okay. <laughs> I'm here if you remember. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite animal is a T Rex. So, uh, do you want to know if he's ever seen a T Rex? Have you ever seen a T Rex? Have, have I ever seen a T Rex? Well, of course, I've never seen a live one, but that, that goes for all of us. Um, I've certainly seen lots of T Rex. There's probably, oh, at least 30 good T Rex skeletons out there. And uh, so I've seen a number of them. I've seen them in Chicago. I've seen them in Saskatchewan. I've seen T-Rex skeletons in Alberta. Although I've never dug, dug one up myself. I have yet to dig up a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton. So if I'm ever able to do that one day, that would be pretty cool. We'll have to do a follow-up presentation. Uh, yeah, ask me that again in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go to Ms. Fram's class who joined us uh, from Rochester, Minnesota after we began grade five. So welcome in guys and uh, come on up. Diesel's coming up, hang on. How do you know a fossil is a fossil? Great question. That is a good question. And it, it, it's hard to know sometimes because um, it takes a while to for your eye to adjust. When you're out collecting fossils, especially if you're a student, you're new, um, it's hard to tell fossils from rock often. Um, but when we're in the field, um, fossils often have a very distinctive texture to them. They've got uh, a sort of grain to them that you can look for. And of course, if you look inside modern bone, you'll see that it's often got a hollow in the middle where the bone marrow goes. It's kind of got a spongy texture on the inside. So if we're ever uh, in doubt about whether we've got a rock or, or a real bone uh, fossil, um, we can look at the texture and look for that sponginess and look for that, that grain that's very distinctive that we see typically both in modern bone and in fossil bone. Good question. Great question. So glad we got to it so quickly. All right, uh, let's go to Miss uh, Gertson's class. If you guys have one, come on up. What is the biggest, largest dinosaur that you have studied? Yeah. What is the largest dinosaur that I've studied? Oh boy. Well, I, I work on big dinosaurs, mainly, what we call mega herbivorous dinosaurs. That is to say, dinosaurs that weighed over a ton that, that ate uh, plants, basically. Um, and so a lot of the uh, dinosaurs that I study are things like duck-billed dinosaurs and horned dinosaurs and armored dinosaurs. I, I showed you guys uh, some examples of these earlier in one of my slides. And these animals probably weighed between, oh, let's say two tons and maybe, maybe upwards of eight tons. Um, so, you know, we're talking about animals that are as, as big as elephants, at least, maybe even a little bit bigger. So those are probably the biggest ones that I've worked on. Outstanding. Good huh? question. Yeah, great questions, guys. Uh, Ms. Jusko's class, uh, come on up if you have one. Um, what is the smallest dinosaur fossil you've ever found? What's the smallest dinosaur fossil? The Brutus. <laughs> We're going from the biggest to the yeah, smallest. Yeah, just right there. <laughs> the smallest dinosaur fossil that I've found, oh boy. Well, I, although I mentioned I study a lot of the big dinosaurs, there are a lot of smaller dinosaurs that are, oh, maybe the size of a, you know, a, a big dog running around at the time. So I'm thinking of uh, things like, uh, dome-headed dinosaurs, what we call the pachycephalosaurs. I'm thinking of things called uh, thescalosaurs as well. Uh, we find those uh, fairly commonly in the Badlands. Um, and, and certainly I've found my share of their teeth and parts of their limb bones. So I'd probably have to go with those. We're talking about, again, animals that are about dog-sized, I would say, the average dog, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, those are some of the smallest ones I found. But um, when we find dinosaur fossils, usually we're talking about, you know, finding little teeth uh, or, or, or little fragments of bone. So, you know, you really have to, you, you might be talking about a fairly big animal, but you're finding very, very small fragments of them quite often. So, um, you know, fossils that'll fit in the palm of your hand, those are, those are found very regularly. Yep. Very cool. Uh, a testament to how big dinosaurs are, by the way, that small dinosaurs are like dog size. That's a fairly sizable animal as they go. So 
Yeah. Well, yeah, they, but they got to be even smaller. You know, we talk about birds being dinosaurs today, and the smallest birds are, of course, uh, hummingbirds. So technically, the smallest dinosaurs uh, are still with us today, and, and, and those are hummingbirds. So, you know, think of a hummingbird being a dinosaur, and then think of something like a, a brontosaurus or a brachiosaurus that weigh, you know, 50 tons. They're, it, it's, they speak they spanned the gamut, you know, it was a, a huge range of body size. Very cool. All right, uh, Miss Hodder's group. So there's a bunch of you guys are in Calgary. So I want to take multiple questions in a row from you guys. If you want to come up first with a question and I'll come right back a second after, okay? And I know we're going to have way more questions that we can possibly take in one day, but come on up and let's take as many as we can. Oh, so your mic's entirely off now. It was on earlier, now it's entirely dead. I don't know what happened. So try and mess with it. Let's, oh, let me get you guys one more time. But just, yeah, how about now? No, like we can hear something, but it's not the full thing. So mess with it. And then worst case scenario, type your question in the chat bar on the bottom, little uh, oval three dots, and I'll take as many as I can, but I will come back in a second. I'm gonna go to Miss Doty's class for now though, and I'll come right back. So Miss Doty's class, come on up guys. Uh I have a question. Um, yeah. what's the? I have two questions. What's the thickest dinosaur bone? Yeah. And my second one is, if you had a dinosaur tooth and you just went to your hands and you did this, what would happen? <laughs> <laughs> so two questions that I heard. What's the thickest dinosaur bone? Well, that's a good question. Um, some of the thickest bones in our own bodies and in the the bodies of most backboned animals would be the thigh bone, what we call the femur. Um, they, they tend to be very thick because they have to hold up our, our bodies uh, and resist a lot of the stress that comes with that. So uh, the thickest, uh, you know, among the dinosaurs, the thickest bones would be something like, uh, let's say a long necked or, or sauropod dinosaur thigh bone. They're, they're just absolutely massive, those things. And then your second question, you'll have to remind me what that was again. What if I took a dinosaur tooth and, and smacked it in between my hands? Yeah, yeah. that was it. Um, well, you know, you look at something like, hold on, I have, a, I have something here. With displays. I, I have a, a T-Rex tooth here. And, you know, people often think of these things as being uh, something like a steak knife. And in a way they are, they've got these little serrations along the edge um, that were used for cutting through meat. But, you know, on the whole, they're they're fairly blunt, um, and, and so they're not going to do much damage to me like so. But if you put several thousand pounds of pressure between that tooth, as T. Rex was capable of, you're going to be able to crunch through bone no problem. And so so these animals, having such strong jaws, so much power behind uh, that bite. Um, would have made mincemeat of me, uh, would have made mincemeat of a car if they had been able to get their jaws around one. Yeah. What a fantastic tooth, by the way. Um, it's a good, uh, it's a, a quality cast, yes. Yeah. Um, all right, Miss Cheryl's class, joining us in Montana, kindergartners. Uh, the first thing they wanted to ask is, why did you choose to look for dinosaurs in Montana? Well, um, because they're all over the place there. So in addition to Alberta, I, I, I've done some field work in, in Montana too. So good to see you guys. Um, um, I mentioned the dinosaur earlier that I named from Montana, an animal called Spiclipius. I didn't find that. That was a man by the name of uh, Dr. Bill Shipp. He found it, but uh, on, on his land out there um, near a, a small town there called Winifred. And uh, after the museum acquired uh, the skull from Bill, he invited me out to do uh, some more research on his land there. So I've, I've been in Montana several times now uh, on Bill's land, uh, looking for more dinosaurs with them. And unfortunately, I'll, I'll, although I found uh, some bits and pieces, I, I haven't found another Spiclipius. Um, but I do go back to Montana on occasion because the dinosaurs that we find there are very closely related to the dinosaurs uh, that we find in Alberta. Of course, Montana is right next to Alberta. And so um, we're very interested in learning how those animals on either side of the border were related to one another. Fantastic. 
Um, a few other quick notes. Miss Clark's class is joining us in Northern California on YouTube. So if you guys want to type in some questions too, please do. Uh, I'm going to come in back and check with Miss uh, Hodder's class in just a second. We have a mystery class. It could be Miss McKay's, could be Miss Holmes' class. Let's go check in with them, see if they have a question for us. Um, this is Miss Holmes' class. Miss Holmes' class. Hi, guys. Welcome in. Do you have a question for us? Yeah, give me one second to call on. <laughs> we have 30 questions for you. All right. Eli, you Good want to questions so far, by the way. Yeah, yeah, great, guys. Oh, you want to come on over? Okay. This is Miss Holmes class, grade threes in Granger, Iowa, by the way. So welcome in. There you go. How long have you been doing paleo paleontology? How long have I been doing paleontology? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I've been interested in paleontology since I was about your age, ever since I was a kid. Um, but I would say as a, as a professional, um, paleontologist here at the museum. Um, uh, I've been working here now for five years. In fact, I just got my diploma, which is over here, or my recognition, my award for, for working here for five years now. So uh, I've been with the museum for five years. And prior to that, um, I, I studied paleontology in university for probably about oh, eight or nine years. So after high school, uh, I was in university for about eight or nine years, uh, uh, learning about paleontology and and you know working on dinosaurs, uh, publishing on them, so writing scientific papers about them. So, all told, oh, uh, probably somewhere on the order of maybe close to fifteen years that I've been really seriously working in in paleontology. Great question, guys. Uh, so that's a note, too. You mentioned nine years after high school. So for the classes who are in grade four, you've got 17 years of school left, which seems ridiculous. But if you do that, you get to be a paleontologist, which is very cool. So <laughs> it's pretty rewarding. I'll, I'll say that much. And, you know, there's lots of different ways to be involved in, in paleontology. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a researcher here at the museum. So, so my job is really to do original research on dinosaurs and, and, and generate new knowledge about them. But um, we have people here who, who work on our dinosaur fossils. So I showed the dinosaurs uh, being brought out of the field and coming back to our labs here at the museum to be worked on. Um, and we have people who, whose job it is to, to actually remove those fossils from the rock. And uh, they don't hold a PhD. You don't need a PhD to be involved in, in paleontology. We have research assistants here who help us out, some of whom have PhDs, some of whom do not. Um, uh, you know, so there's all kinds of ways of getting involved in paleontology that, that do not require, you know, the highest of, of degrees. There's lots of ways of getting your foot in the door. Yeah. One of my favorites that you showed in your presentation was that amazing artwork of dinosaurs and more people are getting into scientific artwork and illustrations, which is fantastic if you have an artistic bent. So, yeah. That's right. And in fact, that was kind of my, my way into paleontology. I grew up with a very, uh, artistic background and my first meeting that I went to uh, of professional paleontologists, I hung out with all the artists there because that was what interested me at the time. And uh, as I continued down that path in, in paleo, I, I gradually moved from the, the art side to the science side, but um, I still very much have a, a great appreciation uh, for all the amazing uh, dinosaur artwork that's being done out there by all kinds of talented people. Fantastic. All right, I, I know we can do questions all day. So what I want to do is this, Ms. Hodder's class, I'm going to come to you guys, see if your mic is working. If it is, great. If not, type in questions in the chat bar. But let's see, so Ms. Hodder's group, can we hear you guys or maybe? Hey, so we can, we can hear you as a group. It's just when you talked into the mic, it didn't come through. So I don't know why that is, but I can hear you. So on the other side of the computer, maybe, if you want to repeat the question of the first student, go for it. Now it's just not happening. So bottom of your screen, little oval. Little, oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. That worked. That worked. No. So now I can hear my. So now I can hear my. Okay. So it's not working, guys. I'm sorry. The mic really messed up in the class. There. Go to the chat bar. Bottom of your screen, little oval, three dots. Type in some questions, and I'll take as many as I can. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, another question from the group on YouTube. Uh, Ms. Carraza's class in Alberta wants to know if you were involved in researching the Borealopelta. So they may have come in later. If you could explain that, would be great. 
So yes, the, the Borealopelta was that ankylosaur, that armored dinosaur that I mentioned earlier that was in that documentary. Um, that was found several years ago now, many, well, probably a, close to 10 years ago. Um, I was not involved directly uh, in the research uh, in naming that animal. Um, although one of uh, the, the uh, students I, I was, that was in my cohort in university, I, I showed a slide with them earlier. Um, his name's uh, Dr. Caleb Brown. Um, he worked on that animal and Caleb's a good friend of mine. Um, Borealopelta did factor into the research that I did on the upside down ankylosaurs that I mentioned. Um, that was another example of one of these fossils that was found on its back. Um, and so I, I, I did research it in that way, but in actually naming the animal, that, that wasn't me, that was my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Caleb Brown. And, uh, and, and Dr. Don Henderson, too, I think, was involved with that as well, um, who worked with me on the upside down ankylosaur. So, you know, dinosaur paleontology is a fairly small group. We're all very tightly knit. And so if I didn't do the work, I, a, a good friend of mine did. <laughs> nice. I'm going to share a picture of the Borealopelta with the classes later because it's probably the most beautiful fossil you'll ever see ever. It's quite it is by far and away one of the nicest fossils to come out of the ground. It, when you look at the animal, the skin is still preserved on it. Um, and all of the armor on the back is preserved and it looks like the animal died yesterday. It's a fascinating find. Awesome. All right, Ms. Hodder's class got in two questions. So I'm gonna take them and then we'll just find out how we can get more questions to you. Because again, we've got hundreds, so we, we couldn't possibly do them all. Ms. Hodder's class yeah. <laughs> wanted to ask, how do you take the jacket off a dinosaur when you've got it all tucked in like that? Yeah, so when we collect the dinosaur, we leave it encased as best we can in the original rock because the rock really helps it, helps hold the, the, the bones in place while we transport the specimen. And to hold that whole package together, we wrap it in this, this shell, as I call it, of, of burlap and plaster. Uh, and when we get it back to the museum, we have to remove um, uh, that, that protective shell of burlap and plaster. And usually we use um, little tools, uh, Dremel tools, which help to basically saw the bone off. So, or, 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 or I should say saw off the, uh, the burlap and plaster. So the same tools that uh, a doctor would use or a nurse would use to remove a cast on your arm, those cast removers, those are the same tools that we use to remove uh, that plaster from a dinosaur fossil. Um, and it's very slow, painstaking work. You can think of, uh, you know, a big giant fossil that's maybe six feet long. Uh, it can take weeks to actually expose the fossil as it was in the field. Yeah. All right, Miss Clark's class on YouTube also got in a question. George wonders what's the most difficult fossil you've ever worked on. The most difficult fossil. Oh boy. Well, the field work that I do uh, in Alberta, I mentioned, is on the South Saskatchewan River. And for whatever reason, uh, the deposits that we find there, the, the rocks that we find there, there's a lot of uh, cliffs. It's very, very steep terrain. And so for that reason, getting around is difficult and removing uh, fossils from the badlands there is very difficult because you can't bring in cars, you can't bring in trucks, there are no roads. Um, and, and because the terrain is really steep, you know, it makes it very difficult to uh, lug a fossil out of there by hand without slipping on the, on the slopes. And so um, uh, for that reason, just about any work I do on the South Saskatchewan River is, is pretty difficult. And I showed you that video um, of my crew and I removing that Chasmosaurus skull a, a few years ago now. We had to bring in a helicopter because the, the terrain was so difficult. So that was probably one of the bigger challenges uh, of my, my career so far was, was removing that skull uh, from the Badlands there. Yeah, very cool. But it, right. was <laughs> <What>? <laughs> say it was a lot of fun, you know, I wouldn't try it. It was a challenge, yeah. This is hard in the scheme of things, you know, it's difficult, but you're still getting to have a good time. Absolutely. Um, all right, one last question from our class, and I love it. So, from Miss Hodder's group, if you were to be a dinosaur, what dinosaur would you be? If I were to be a dinosaur, what dinosaur would I be? Oh boy, I'd, I'd probably want to be, you know what I think I'd want to be? I, I wouldn't want to get eaten. 
there there's a lot of uh, of big meat eaters around at the the days of the dinosaurs you know think of uh, t-rex think of allosaurus think of giganotosaurus i'm sure a lot of you kids know those names and so i i, I wouldn't want to be messed with by one of them so i would probably say that i, I i'd want to be uh, an ankylosaur these are the these big club tail dinosaurs because they were so well protected uh they had a back full of armor uh, many of them, not all of them, had a big club on the, their ends of the tails that they used to protect themselves. Um, and we know, looking at their fossils, that they don't often show signs of, of tooth marks, signs of, uh, of predation, the way a lot of horn dinosaurs or duckbill dinosaur bones do. So it, it doesn't seem like they were picked on very free, frequently by mm -hmm. the big meat eaters. So I think I'd want to be one of them. I'd, I'd be safe that way, I think. Perfect. I love the answer. Good question. <laughs> so before we wrap up again, we have, had, we have kids lining up. We have way too many questions we can take. Is there a way that kids can ask you more questions? Can we either share some questions with you or is there a way that they can get in touch with the museum and reach you that way? How do we... Uh... Yeah, um, I'll give out my email address because I'm, I'm happy to take questions from, from all of you. Um, so my email address, if, if you guys want to write it down, is is simply J Mallon, that's J M A L L O N at nature.ca. That's where I work. So J Mallon, J M A L L O N at nature.ca. And, uh, you know, kids ask the best questions. So I'll be happy to field any questions you guys might have. If you want, maybe your teachers wants to uh, put them all in an email, I'll get, get my answers to you as soon as I can. We'll see if I regret it. <laughs> I, I was going to say, that's fantastic. Thank you so, so much for that. I'm going to pass along all the other resources you mentioned earlier in the presentation to our classes too, and that email address. And you can let me know how many, uh, how full your inbox is later. I'll be uh, curious to see that myself. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Uh, guys, thank you so, so much for all of this. Jordan, this has been really fantastic to our classes. We really appreciate you coming in today. And so what we do at the end of every session is I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. And so boys and girls, if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to Jordan for joining us today. You are all now demuted. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's gone madness. It's crazy. Awesome, thank guys. You. Thank you so much. I, uh, I appreciate your interest, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see some of you out there one day at a museum or, or in the field or what have you. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much, Dr. Mellon. We really appreciate you joining us, and have a wonderful rest of your day. My pleasure. Thanks, guys.